Welcome to the Leadernomics Show. I'm with Dato C.Y. Lee, who's President and CEO of Genting Malaysia and also the President uh, and CEO of Genting UK. Dr. Lee, welcome to the show. Thank you. You know, you have a very, very interesting background. Mm. Uh, you sort of worked your way investment banking, uh, accounting, investment banking, and finally taking over as CEO, president, or president of Genting. Can you tell us a little bit of background on how you got to where you got to? Um, I started as a trainee accountant. Uh, in those days, uh, to be a chartered accountant, uh, you need to article mm -hmm. with a firm of uh, um, professional accountants. I started in London after having um, graduated in the UK. I joined the London firm of Ernst and Winnie in those days. I think it's since become Ernst yes. and Young. Um, so as a trainee accountant, uh, the experience uh, is, uh, I would say, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, what were some of the things you learned there? Because as, as a trainee accountant, you uh, most of the time you spend doing audit mm -hmm. uh, in the first uh, mm -hmm. three or four years. And you get exposure to the whole range of industries. Uh, some of my most interesting audits uh, you know, and, and it's very character building because you have to do a job of work during the day, uh, which sometimes can be you know, 9 to 5, mm. sometimes 9 to whatever it takes. But on top of that, uh, uh, you have to do professional exams during that time. So that means at the end of the day, after your work, you, know, you have to go home and study right. because you, there's no such thing as time off to study. You don't take months off to go and prepare for exams, no such thing. Mm. So actually it's very character building. But more importantly, I think uh, the industries that I covered was very interesting. One of which, for instance, I audited the helicopter company, people who manufacture helicopters. Right. So as a young man of 20, 22, you know, you've not even seen a helicopter, but to audit and be very near a manufacturer, to be in a manufacturing facility, watching people put helicopters So you together. actually went into the manufacturing facility? Yes. Oh, this okay. is a Westland helicopter down wow. in Yeovil in the UK. So to watch people put helicopters together, it's fascinating. <laughs> the other fascinating one I remember was I audited, and, and this is, uh, I audited the Freemasons. Okay. The you Freemasons. Wow. I mean, people know it's a very <laughs> secretive society. So I can't they, they, allow, they allow themselves, they allow to, be allow themselves to be audited. So, so, so it's not so secretive <laughs> after all. No, but what I, what I enjoyed most about that particular audit, I don't think they do things very differently from any other mm. charitable organizations. They invest their money and all that mm -hmm. sort of thing. But what was, what was interesting is I, was, uh, I had this honor of being shown around a temple. They call it the wow. temple. Okay. Okay. Uh, which is right in the center of London in a, in a very... Uh, and if you didn't know any better, you think it's an office building mm. uh, uh, right in the centre of London, but inside is a huge cavernous auditorium. Uh, that's what they call the temple. So that was a very interesting. So you know event. all the deep dark secrets uh, of the Freemason. I'm not sure about <laughs> the. I don't I'm not sure about the secrets whether there are any <laughs> secrets. But you know, like I said, they didn't do things very differently. Mm. Uh, certainly from the financial point of view, anyway. So. So uh, you 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 did a couple of years of audit and. Then no, I think in in those days you need to do three four years depending on how you progress with exams. You have to you have to pass through professional exams. Mm. Uh, and the most important thing about you know the profession is that you know uh, you. Uh, like I said, it's very character building in the sense that you need to uh, work during the day and you, you, have, you have to study uh, in the evening and to do two sets of professional right. exams. So how did you progress from audit to investment banking and from London to Hong Kong? Yeah, I, I did, uh, after, after Ernst & Young, uh, I decided to travel. Uh, I was on the way back to Malaysia, mm. uh, on the way back to Malaysia and I decided to stop over in Hong Kong. Uh, what turned out to be like you know, a month just to you know, spend some time with the friends ended up as eight years in Hong Kong. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, I decided to join Ernst & Young in Hong Kong. Uh, after having spent you know, a couple of weeks there, I decided that that was the place I, I thought I, I would enjoy. And, and, and you know, I thought maybe spend some time in Hong Kong and then return to Malaysia. Like I said, you know, a few weeks turned into uh, months, you know, and years. months and then it was eight years. I started off at Ernst & Young, enjoyed my career there. Again, tremendous experience in the early, mm -hmm. late 80s and you early You were still 90s. doing auditing work? I was doing, doing auditing work, but Hong Kong is a diff different kettle of fish. Mm -hmm. Hong Kong gave people experience very early on. You know, you're given very young, you're just given lots of experience. Mm -hmm. So you're running huge jobs on your own, you are uh, leading a teams and, and you are signing off, you're given authority, you mm -hmm. know, you, you're given responsibility, there, which is fantastic mm -hmm. because it mm -hmm. prepares you for life. Uh, later on. From there, I, I decided that, you know, um, and I had exposure to investment banking as, a, as, a, as an accountant. I, you know, we dealt with professionals like investment banks yep. and all that sort of thing. 
And I thought that was interesting, so I decided to go into investment bank. So I the cultural the, the, cultural, the cultural world, world of investment <laughs> bank. And again, you know, it was a, a, an exciting time in the early '90s in Hong Kong. I worked for a British investment bank, and uh, we did a lot of IPOs. Uh, it was amazing. We did uh, almost an IPO every week. So mm. it's like you know, wow. again, you know, unheard of. You know, it was one of the major IPO houses. All we did was IPOs, and 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 every week we were doing one IPO. Again, some of the most interesting, uh, and this was, all, all this uh, that I've done in auditing and investment bank, uh, in retrospect, really gave me great exposure mm. to, to a variety types, of things, right? All yeah. sorts of businesses and industries, right? And industry, and you 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 learn uh, very early on what makes business tick, mm. how business works, mm. how management works, strategic thinking strategies that go into successful businesses and you also see the failures you know why do certain companies fail mm. you also see the intrigues of um, yeah, um, the interplay of uh, people mm. government regulatory authority and stakeholders yeah. uh, stakeholders various types of things how, how they interplay and how it works yeah. sometimes and how it you know, creates results in disasters sometimes. Right. And you know, my, my old boss uh, always said finance is the language of business and everyone should know finance. Absolutely. Would you, would you recommend everybody have some dose of finance in their career? I, th I think, I think uh, again, looking back, finance, uh, if you really didn't understand finance, it's very difficult to understand a business. Right, and to run a business, right? And for us, somebody who has spent some time in you know, finance, starting life as an accountant, and investment banking is all about finance yep. as well. It's yep. all about figures. And you know, every time I look at numbers, they talk to me. You mm. know, they tell you a story. Yep. The great thing about chartered accountancy, the great thing about you know being a trainee accountant in those days, it teaches you certain very basic principles, which I still find very very useful today. It it, it develops a very inquisitive mind. Mm. As an auditor, you have to ask lots of questions, right. and you learn to listen very early on. Second thing it teaches you to ask is, once you get an answer. Is this reasonable? If somebody mm. tells you an answer, you have to decide for yourself, is this reasonable? And then you come to a conclusion, yes, that is reasonable. Mm. Whatever I was told, uh, you know, yes. it, 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 it is, it is uh, I can conclude that it's reasonable or it is not. not yeah. you know? so, so that is very helpful in, in, in when we become uh, in, in general management, mm. in senior management, because a lot of times you have to decide on very incomplete a set of information. And I always tell young people, look, you cannot wait till you have a complete set of information because it's not going to exist. Yeah, that's true. You will have to decide uh, on sometimes very incomplete information. And you have to make decisions based you on just that. You have base decisions yep. based on that. You can't say, look, can I have another one month? Business just doesn't wait for right. you for another one month. So it actually teaches you because as a leader, you have to ultimately make decisions based on You have on to make decisions and sometimes you have to make it very quickly. Sometimes, like I said, most of the time you have right. to make it on a... After a while, it becomes a gut feel. Really, it's not a gut feel. It, you develop that s a very acute sense of, you know, an inquisitive mind. You ask the question, and then you decide whether the answer you get is reasonable. Mm -hmm. I, I always tell people in general management, you don't need to know everything, but you must know what questions you you, you need to ask. Right. And if you don't know the answer, you need to know where to find the answer. That's mm. that's a skill of a senior management and a senior executive. Yeah, you don't true. have to know everything because we don't know everything. Yep. It's not possible. So how, how did you transition from a you know, IPO <laughs> auditing background Investment. to leading a business? I yeah. mean, ultimately like I said, you know, I mean, having seen so many businesses, again, you know, um, it just, um, as professionals, as consultants, whether uh, you know, advisors, accountants, investment bankers, I felt a lot of time you advise people, uh, you raise funds for people. And after that, you leave them to their devices, and you never quite know what ever happened. Most of the time, consultants and people leave people behind, and I don't know whether it succeeds or not. So I was quite determined to actually have a taste of my own medicine and say, <laughs> look, you know, you tell people what to do, you never quite know whether it succeeds. So why don't I do it myself? And this, this whole thing, I, you know, running a business happened quite by chance. You know, I, I was still a corporate person. I came back, I decided it was time to return to Malaysia. I wanted to be here, and, and I looked around. I was going to continue in investment banking, uh, but b quite by chance, you know, I came across Genting, and and 
I liked the way that the decision was made. I was hired the same day. I saw the people here, a very senior uh, person here, Tan Sri, the Tan Sri. I was hired the same day. I saw him in the morning. He said, why don't you come in the evening and we, we will settle it then. So that's how quickly it was done. And uh, like I said, the rest was you know, history. I've been with them ever since 15 years. Uh, I started off in, in what they call corporate affairs, really looking after you know, you know, uh, investments, and monitoring and, and mm. evaluating investments. Came the crisis in 98, and, and I was told, look, there's not much investments going on. Why don't you take a look at Thai Kinting Highlands and see if, that, if there's anything you want to do? So I took a look at it, and um, I spent, I decided, yes, I'll take on the challenge of running you know, it. Looking, no, 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 not running it then. I said, I'll take a challenge of helping out. Okay. In, in, and so I took a position of planning. Okay. In those days, it was a position created uh, for me. Within six months, I was asked if I wanted to run the finance function, and I, I reluctantly said yes. <laughs> uh, reluctant, I've always been a reluctant one. And then six months later, they said, look, why don't you want to run the, 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 the resort? Again, I was very, very um, cautious, but you know, I'm a great believer if you're asked. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, and an opportunity and arises and jump on it. Arose. I didn't go looking for it. Uh, Sometimes life is like that. You mm. don't really have to look for it because uh, if you have demonstrated an ability, I think sometimes you may be yep. asked to do things. And I was asked and I, was, I, I obliged and I've been doing it for the last 12, 13 years. And, and so what's your biggest challenge now in leading this business? I think we, uh, th th we are going through a very exciting phase of our development as a company. Uh, we are going very global uh, just in the last three or four years from managing Genting Highlands. I've had to transition uh, managing international assets. We bought uh, uh, UK casinos. Right. You mm -hmm. know, there are 45 casinos in the UK. So I have to you know, run that as a CEO now. Um, we also open up a racino in, in New York. Yeah, yeah. Again, um, it's, um, it's, a, you know, it's a large, large business uh, in New York, 5,000 slot machines, um, and which will, you know, again, put us on an expansionary yep. path. Mm. Uh, again, it's a very exciting time for me personally right. because there are two sets of different assets. More importantly, the people are mm. very different. A UK culture uh, and a US culture. Again, having to manage two groups of people right. in a different cultural setting, different environment, different culture, different people. Mm. To me, it's, it's very exciting. Yeah. You know, Dealing with people every day is very exciting. And I would say that's the most difficult part of any management job, uh, people. Mm. Uh, there's no one-size-fits-all type of you know, management situation. Right. Every person is different. You must have your consistent principles as a, as a management, as a, you know, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a leader. You must have certain principles which are consistent, whether you are a managing Americans or managing uh, you know, Europeans, British people. Yeah. Yeah. But you must manage them differently. Mm. The principles that are consistent are like fairness, firmness. Uh, those must be consistent. Uh, your philosophy, you know, uh, those are consistent. But dealing with individuals, you must be able to cater to you know different people mm. because the biggest, I think, the biggest uh, uh, for me, the biggest secret of managing people is first of all trying to understand what their strengths or weaknesses. It sounds a bit cliche. Yeah, yeah. But really, it's true because if you try to make somebody, no matter what it is, you try to make somebody do something that he's bad at, you're going to ask for disasters, right? But I try not to look at that side of things. I say, look, what, what is this person's strength? And mm. try to make him do things he's good at, yeah. and try, you know, not to make him do things he's not good yeah. at, or passionate right? about, or, yeah. or passionate about, yeah. because you're going to ask for trouble if you if you don't know that. Now, if you don't know that, you ask the person to do anything, then you're asking for trouble, and mm. you're asking for disappointment. Uh, uh, both parties are yeah. disappointed at the end of the day, and you get the worst out of each other. Uh, to me, that's the biggest secret about people. Mm. And different, and different people have different, uh, you know, strengths and weaknesses. Uh, like I said, it sounds so simple, but it really is not yeah. because it, to s to try to work out what that person is, because he's not going to tell you sometimes. But even if he tells you, he may not know it himself what his strengths or weaknesses are. Yeah, that's true. That's uh, true. To me, that is very, very important about managing people. Okay. Yeah. What, what advice would you give a young person who's just graduated from university and coming out into the workplace and raring to you know, make a difference in the world? Yeah. Uh, you know, one of, one, of, one, of the, one of the things that I see a lot these days is people jumping from jobs to jobs. 
And when I see a CV like that, I really have a lot of reservation because uh, I'm a bit old-fashioned like that. Maybe the world is changing, you know, the cyber world and the internet world, things are different. But I still believe strongly you must be in a job for a certain amount of time to really be on the, the learning curve, to really pick to up, maximize you know, that, to yeah. maximize yeah. that. Because if you are jumping jobs every two years, you know, it takes you about a year to know your boss or your subordinate, and another one, another half years to work your way around the system, the mm, process. The culture thing, yeah. how, can, how can you ever pick up anything? You know, I mean, my own experience, I have resisted, and I think quite rightly, you know, the lure of just money. A lot of people just switch job for just that extra little bit. But I think you've got to find something you really like, mm. and you've got to be passionate about, something you think you can excel, right? And uh, again, this is sounds cliche, but there's no substitute for hard work. Mm. There really is. I've not met anybody who's successful and who's lazy. Yeah, I've never. No matter how brilliant you are. Sure, these days there are a lot of young billionaires and all that, so they look as if they've made it you know, so yeah. easily. I, mean, I can but guarantee they hard, you, yeah. they worked hard, even though they're very young. And they will continue to work hard because that's what drives them. Mm. I've never seen any people who are successful and not work hard and be driven. Mm. Not really. Yeah, never. Okay. Yeah. Maybe many young people want to become CEOs. Yeah. You know, they aspire to one day become like you and, mm. and, and the other leaders. Um, is there something that they should be looking for? I mean, what advice would you give someone who's wanting to become a CEO? I think, I think, I think it's a very honorable aspiration. Um, and I'm a genuine believer that uh, leaders are not born. Not born. You yep. just can acquire the, the, skill, the set. skill set, the qualities, but of course they have to work at it. Uh, I am one of the lucky ones that have uh, exposed the right exposure, the right training. People gave me the right training along the way, and the right mentors along the way. Find mm. the right mentors, mm. find the right people to work for, um, and all along my career, you know, I had right mentors. So. You know, the, the advice is be patient, find something passionate, work hard at it. Uh, patient in the sense that, you know, don't keep you know, switching jobs for, you know, just the extra money. Because uh, once, you are, uh, once you are able to find something passionate, once you can develop all the skills that, you know, you can acquire, mm. whether it's from your mentor, from study, from training, uh, once you have all the qualities uh, that can potentially get you to that position of senior leadership, then the rest is really how much you want it yep. and how much you're prepared to put in it. That really, I think, to me, you know, encapsulates. Fantastic. Uh, yeah. oh, thanks a lot the, for your insights. Route, yeah. I appre appreciate it. I've been talking to Dato C. Y. Lee, President and CEO of Genting Malaysia and, and CEO of Genting UK. Dato Lee, thanks for being on our show. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.